So we now have the numbers. I have brought them uh, here. So just take a look at this uh, numbers. So what we have is suppose we are using a 802.11b system, which is 11 Mbps. <coughs> okay. So that implies that approximately in one microsecond you are going to transfer 11 bits, right? Okay. <coughs> And we are using a G711 voice codec, which samples at the rate of 64 kbps every 20 milliseconds, right? So now 64 kbps every 20 milliseconds uh, translates to 160 bytes per packet, okay? So what this basically means is that the voice codec is going to generate a 160 byte packet every 20 milliseconds, okay? In order to establish the voice call, right? And now, so in one second, how many such packets are going to be generated? 50 packets in each direction, right? So there are going to be 50 packets in going from the client to the other end and 50 packets coming in the reverse direction as well, okay? So this is the total number of uh, packets that have to be fitted in, in one second of the 11 Mbps channel, <coughs> right? So I've also found out the numbers for the various uh, headers, RTP header is 12 bytes, UDP header is 8 bytes, IP header is 20 bytes, MAC header is 34 bytes. Phi header is typically not calculated in bytes but in microseconds. So the phi header for 11 Mbps is 96 microseconds, okay? The AX size is 14 bytes, okay? So now we need to calculate how many calls can be supported, right? <coughs> So the way you want to do this is you, you want to find out how much, how many bits does one call correspond to, okay? So try to go back and forth between bits and microseconds because SIFS time is 20 microseconds, right? 20 microseconds again now corresponds to a certain number of bits. So if you keep going back and forth, you'll be able to find out, okay? So you have a VoIP packet which is coming in. It's going to wait for DIFS amount of time. Then there may be a back off then the data has to go, right? Ignoring RTS CTS overhead. Okay, if you add the RTS CTS, it's going to become worse. But generally for voice, you will not do RTS CTS because you are never going to do retransmission on this, right? So uh, ignoring the RTS CTS, so you'll have the data that it goes out, again another SIFS, then an act that has to come, okay? So then we'll see how big does that packet become and how many such things can fit in a 11 Mbps system. One minute. Okay, so let's go stepwise. I have actually lost the sheet on which I had the answers. So just to be alert to see if I'm making any errors here. Okay, so first you want to see uh, number of bits per VoIP packet, right? So we want to find out what is the total, what is the number of bits that go for each VoIP packet? How much is that? That will be DIFS plus back off, right? Because you are always going to have packets in the queue. So you can't assume that there is no back off. Like we were talking before uh, lunch, that the access point is always going to have to do some back off. DIFS plus back off plus data plus SIFS plus ACK. Right? This is what is going to be the number of bits. Now DIFS is 50 microseconds. Plus back off, we'll have to now assume a certain number of slots, right? So the total value that we come to depends upon what is the value of back off that we are going to assume. So let's say we are assuming a back off value of seven. Is that okay? Seven sounds reasonable. So seven as the back off value, seven into into 20, 20, right? Slot time is 20 microseconds. So 7 into 20 microseconds, right? So this is in microseconds. So we just we have to be a bit careful since we are going back and forth between bits and seconds, okay? So what is the data now? Data was, we had 1280 bits per packet, correct? So we had 1280 bits. Bits 
plus SIFS was 10 microseconds plus AC is 112 bits, right? Okay. So now if we convert this uh, thing entirely into bits, what we will get is for how much is 1 microsecond? 1 microsecond kind of corresponds to 11 bits, right? So this will be 550 bits plus 1, okay, what is this? 140 into 11, correct? 1540, okay plus 1280 plus headers, right? How much is that? 1280 plus 592, 1056, right? Plus 10, right? 110 plus 112, correct? So this turns out to be 6520. Now how many such packets have to fit in a second? Yeah, number of VoIP packets, so number of VoIP packets per second is 50 into 2, right? <coughs> 50 into 2 packets is what we are going to be having per second, which is, a pro, which is 100 packets, okay? So, correct? Per second, so per call. So, what does that mean? That means number of bits per VoIP call 6520000. So, this is 0.65 megabits, right? So, what is the number of calls that we can do? Okay, in 11 Mbps system you have 11 megabits is what you have. Each guy is going to occupy 0.65, correct? So what does this turn out to be? Roughly around 18, okay? So what is the key here? <coughs> How can this increase? This can increase if this slots that we are assuming for the back off increases, correct? If you are going to assume a one slot back off, then you can have higher uh, number of calls, but that is not a realistic assumption. Typically, you have to assume some average. If you have a large number of uh, calls in your system, you have to take some average and uh, if you are taking a window of 0 to 15, then 7 would, about, would be about the average number of uh, slots that you have to back off. So this is what you get for a 11 Mbps system. Okay. So if it is a 54 Mbps system, automatically this number changes. Right? And if it is a 802.11e system, then this number changes. But most of the other numbers are going to remain the same. Okay? If you are using a different codec, then again the data number of uh, bits that you have for the data is going to change. So basically 1280 bits is useful data. And what we are actually being forced to spend is 6520 bits. That is the real killer in your Wi-Fi system. Okay. So what are the things that we haven't taken into account here? So if you had a way of compressing all these headers and making it very efficient, then you could decrease it. But if you keep on doing it, then you'll reach a GSM-like system where you will give a identification number, you will give a connection ID. So when we talk about WiMAX later on today, we'll find that we do away with all these headers. Okay, because WiMAX is, was uh, invented after you know, people learned about A22.11e and all that. Okay. So WiMAX says that, okay, let me not have all these headers. Let me have a connection identifier. The moment I have a connection identifier, I just use the connection identifier in my MAC header itself straight away. Okay. So all these uh, RTP headers, UDP headers can be gotten rid of. So that is the summary of 802.11 which is kind of the most important uh, standard or technology to be studied since the past few years and for the next few years, okay? <coughs> okay. So now let us go on to other topics.
Okay, is everybody uh, woken up? All right. So let's go on to other topics, <coughs> where we talk about how does the routing happen. Now that there is mobility, we want to now try to figure out how to do routing. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so the key motivation is that the traditional routing is based on IP addresses, okay. <clears throat> but that is not useful for me because if I want to change IP address each time a mobile node moves from here to there, I do not want to go through the trouble of having to change the IP address every time, right? things are going to break and so on. So that is not a good solution, basically that is what this slide is summarizing. Okay. <clears throat> So, what other ways are there in which I could attempt? So, one attempt is you know I could change entries in the routing table. In the router itself I can say that okay such and such IP address which was here as part of your subnet has now moved into another router subnet, right. I could change uh, routing table entries. That again is not a good solution because it will not scale, right. I have to keep going into the router and keeping on changing the number of entries, okay. So, our requirement now is that we want a solution which retains the same IP address as far as the host is concerned okay? and it has to be able to work in a uh, transparent manner. Okay? <clears throat> so, this is, so the problem is like this, I have a source which is sending data through a router to a mobile node. Okay? Now, the mobile node is going to move to another network. And I want this communication to continue. Okay, so that is the requirement. How do we solve this? Yeah, I have to redirect, but let us do it stepwise. If we jump ahead, then we will skip some steps and our solution will not work. Okay, so what is the first thing that I need? Okay, <coughs> so let me just click one more time. This is basically what we want to show happening, right. <coughs> We have a mobile node which moves from one network into the other network and we want to make such a thing happen. Okay, so, what are the key things that we need in our solution? So, again let us ask questions. Okay. Okay, how does mobile node, right? Mobile node, IP, mobile IP uses MN as the terminology. How does mobile node get access in the new network. This is the first question that you want to ask. Okay, let us not try to answer any questions. Let us list down the questions first. What is the next question you want to ask? Let us say we figured this out. Then, so the second question that you want to ask is, how does mobile node inform the old network okay, which is called its home of its new location. Then third question is how do I forward the packets? Okay? How do the networks and the mobile node forward the packets in each direction? Once you ask the correct question the answer is obvious, right. <coughs> so, you ask the questions now, are there any more questions to ask? These are the three main ones that we need to ask. Okay. Now, let us figure out the answers. How does the mobile node get access in the new network? So, basically in order to get access, so if you break this down into further steps, how does it get access to the new network is basically how does it know, what we are saying is how does mobile node know about what is called the foreign agent. Okay. Foreign agent is the router which is going to help it to do all these things, correct. How does the mobile node know about the foreign agent? That guy has to do some advertisement. So, the first step is any router which is mobile IP capable has to keep sending out advertisements. It is just like beacons that we talked about in GSM, right? it has to keep sending out advertisements saying that I am a mobile IP capable router. Then it has to do what is called registration. Okay? So, the next question is 
how does the mobile node talk to the foreign agent? I have heard about the foreign agent as a, through the advertisement. I have heard about the foreign agent through the advertisement and uh, now I need to figure out how to talk to the foreign agent. Okay. <coughs> so, in that case I am going to be able to I am going to have to send some packet to the foreign agent in order to uh, get access. Okay. Then what happens? The next question is how does it get, how does it inform its home network about the new location? Correct. There has to be a link between the so, this is again called registration. So, I am going to do a registration through the foreign agent with home agent through the foreign agent. So, what, what will I inform now? I am going to say that I was such and such IP address registered in the home network. Now, I have moved to this foreign network and this is the new IP address which has been assigned to me. Correct? That is basically what I am going to say as my registration message. And then how do the networks forward packets in each direction? This is a process called tunneling. Okay. Okay, sometimes there are two L's in it, sometimes there is one L in it depending on which system you are following. Right? <coughs> what is tunneling basically? Yeah. It is encapsulation, it is like taking an envelope putting it into another envelope and putting it back out into the postal system. Okay. So, you write a different address on the envelope, but primarily you are using the same system, same postal mechanism you are using. You take one envelope, you received it, you took a new one, put this into that, write a new address and send it out into the same system. Once it reaches the other end, you remove the first envelope to get back the original envelope. Okay, so, the question is that uh, why is it the reverse of uh, what happens in boot P, where the responsibility is that of the person who comes into the network to look for a uh, somebody who is going to assign a dynamic address. right? So, actually mobile IP has a lot of variants. So, I am just trying to do one basic variant here. There is a variant of mobile IP in which the router will not send out the advertisement, but it is the responsibility of the mobile node which upon getting into a new network has to send a query. Okay. So, it will send a query into the network saying is there a mobile IP enabled router here and then the router has to reply to that. So, there are like umpteen variations of mobile IP. So, what I am trying to get across here is that it is all very straightforward if we know what are the steps that we need to follow. Okay. So, if you look at the terminology, you have mobile node and you have a home agent, correct? <coughs> mobile node is the node that moves across networks, home agent is the host, host in the home network, typically a router, it registers the location of the mobile node, tunnels packets to the care of agent, care of agent is also the foreign agent. Okay. <coughs> foreign agent is the host in the foreign network forwards the tunnel packets to the mobile node, care of address is the current address of the mobile node. Okay. Let us look at a figure. So, this is basically what is happening. Okay. So, C n stands for correspondent node, C n is going to send data to the mobile node. Does the correspondent node need to know that this guy has moved and all? No, right. The correspondent node does not need to know that he has moved. So, he sends data to the original network itself. This home agent captures this packet, puts it in another envelope which is this red thing that you see here, okay, it puts it in another envelope, tunnels that packet to the foreign agent. Now, the foreign agent is going to remove the encapsulation and get back the original packet which is then sent on to the mobile node. Okay. So, it is a very straightforward uh, system if we look at it at this abstract level. If we go down one more level deeper, then we will start seeing some intricacies. Okay. <coughs> so, sender sends the IP sends to the IP address of the mobile node, the home agent intercepts the packet, home agent tunnels the packet to the care of agent. Okay. In this case, the care of agent is the foreign agent, and then the foreign agent forwards the packet to the mobile node. Okay. <coughs> Who is doing proxy ARP? What is proxy ARP? Okay, see now. 
if we start asking some more deeper questions here then we will find all the answers right so what is uh, what i what do i need to know suppose somebody is trying to connect to this mobile node for the first time okay think of what happens in this network okay <coughs> now there may be a node in this network which is also trying to connect to your same mobile node okay what happens to that guy right so think of it like this there is a node here there is another node here this guy is trying to connect to that guy right one node is trying to connect to the other other node it doesn't know that the other node has moved away okay so what is the first step that this node is going to take is going to send a r request to get the mac id correct so it's going to make an r request to get the mac id as a result of which but that ip address is not there and this network anymore right so the home agent has to keep track of all the fellows who have gone out and it has to give its own mac address as the corresponding ip address that is what is called proxy rp okay so the home agent has to uh, fool other people in the network as though it is the mobile node it has to give the proxy rp reply to the mobile node that thereby capturing the packets and then it will tunnel the packets correct <coughs> okay what else so how does data transfer happen from the mobile node is that the mobile node can now send the packet directly to the correspondent node so this is the basic operation first you have an agent advertisement so i'm just going to do the simple part and then i'll ask a question okay so first you have the agent advertisement where the home agent foreign agents periodically send advertisement messages into their physical subnets right mobile node listens to these messages and detects if it is in the home or the foreign network correct <coughs> then the mobile node reads a care of address what is a care of address it's a temporary ip address okay it's a temporary ip address which you are given in the new network so it reads the care of address from the foreign agent advertisement message okay then the mobile node registers it sends the care of address to the home agent home agent does an acknowledgement okay <coughs> okay let's uh, not worry about security at this point and then you have the home agent advertises the ip address and it does a proxy finally the home agent tunnels the packets to the mobile node okay <clears throat> so that is the question that is the next question that we have to ask right so suppose the firewalls are going to permit only topologically correct addresses then what do i do okay then i have to send it back to the home agent and let the home agent send it to the correspondent node okay then there are other optimizations which are called triangular routing you know informing the correspondent node and all that okay so let's do an example like this now suppose there are two mobile nodes okay let's say uh, two mobile hosts mh1 and mh2 okay and their for home agents okay ha1 and ha2 okay let's say this is given we have two networks two mobile nodes and their home agents okay so now mh1 is in its home network mh2 is in a foreign network now suppose mh1 initiates data transfer with mh2 what is the path of the packets okay just talk to each other wake each other up and just try to determine this answer mh2 being in a foreign network doesn't necessarily mean it's in ha1 it could be in any network okay let's see if we can get this <coughs> okay so what do you have you have network 1 okay this is network 1 let's say this is mobile host mh1 and then let's say there is ha1 in my network 1 okay let's say this network is connected to okay network 2 
where you have H A 2 correct <coughs> and let us say this guy has moved off to a third network okay. and here is where the M H 2 has moved correct. M H 1 is in a in its home network which with H A 1 right and M H 2 has moved into a foreign network. So, let us say this guy is called F A 2. Okay, let us not complicate things by making the same H A and F A. Okay. <coughs> so, this is called F A 2. Right. So, F A 2 may turn out to be the same as H A 1, it does not matter. Okay. <coughs> so, we can consider them as different as far as we are concerned. Okay. So, what is the path of the packets? So, M H 1 what is what are we doing? M H 1 is initiating the data transfer right. So, M H 1 will it go to H A 1 or not? Depends. If H A 1 is the router then it will go to H A 1. If H A 1 is not the router then it need not go to H A 1 right. It has to go through the router for that network ok. So, if H A 1 is the router it will go to H A 1 right and then it will go to H A 2 ok. H A 2 is going to tunnel it tunnel it to F A 2 right is that making sense? F A 2 will decapsulate it and send it on to M H 2 ok. <coughs> So, this is uh, tunnel and this is decapsulation. So, F A 2 H A 2 will do the encapsulation and F A 2 will do the decapsulation ok. <coughs> is that fine? Fairly straightforward uh, action that is happening ok. So, question is how often should mobile node keep on updating the home network about its changing position. Whenever it changes the same thing happens right, it is always a trade off you have to play the trade off. So, two options are there I can update it every time I move to a new network or I can leave what is called a for forwarding pointer right. I do not update the new network suppose I move from F A 2 to let us say another F A 3 instead of updating the home network I can just leave a forwarding pointer and let the packets come chasing behind me ok that is a possibility. But typically what, what will happen in a typical mobile IP implementation is that this registration has a lifetime. See when you are updating the home network that is called registration. So, there is a registration lifetime associated with it. So, before the expiry of the registration lifetime a new registration request has to come that is the basic uh, principle. Okay. So, what is the kind of information the home agent is maintaining? Can we try to draw? Okay. So, let us say mobile MH1 has an IP address. Okay. So, let us try to do this with IP address. Let us say this is 10.129.1.1. Okay. And let us say this guy was this guy is 10.100.5.2. This was M H 2's original IP address, okay. And this network is 10, let's say 10 dot 8 dot. It's a 10 dot 8 network, okay. <coughs> so what will happen now? So the M H 2's original IP address is 10 dot 100 dot 5 dot 2, correct. Now when it arrives in a 10.8 network this foreign agent has got to do a mapping or it has to assign an IP address to the mobile host ok. So, this guy will assign an IP address like of the form 10.8.13.5 something right. So, this is my uh, IP address this is what is your care of address ok. So, often the foreign agent will just assign its own IP address as a care of address it does not matter because it is going to do the decapsulation ok. 
So, what is the table the foreign agent is maintaining? Foreign agent has to maintain this table saying for a visitor called 10.100.5.2, I have assigned the IP address 10.8.13.5. Correct? So, there is a table which is to be maintained by the foreign agent. Now, once the MH2 is doing the registration with the home agent, the home agent is also going to maintain a similar table, right? With the entries reversed, it's going to say that actually the same entries 10.100.5.2 is going to map it to 10.8.13.5. Right. So, now what is going to happen when I am doing the encapsulation? So, the packet that I am getting, this, this is the source IP, right, and this is the destination IP. Okay. In the packet that I am receiving, the source IP is that of MH1, the destination IP is that of MH2, original IP address of MH2, correct. So, the first thing that the home agent is going to do is it is going to look up this table, it is going to see that this node has moved to this area, new IP address. So, it is going to create another packet. So, what is going to be the IP address that goes across the tunnel? It is going to be the home agent as the source and the foreign agent as the destination. Okay. So, the home agent at the, as the source and the foreign agent as the destination. So, that is how the tunnel is going to happen. And then at the foreign agent, it is again going to look it up saying that, okay, I have received a packet for this guy 10.8.13.5 and that actually maps to 10.100.5.2 and it will just deliver it to the mobile host. So, okay, in this case, I have not given it a proper router looking address, okay, 13.1 if we give, okay, it would be a router's address. The care of address could be a router's address and the router can just keep mapping at the socket level, right. It can just say that, you know, this address on this port number, I am giving it to that particular uh, machine. Okay, so that's possible. Okay, let's do one more step of this exercise before we go on to the next topic. So the next question is, okay, what is the path taken by MH1 now moves to a foreign network? What happens when MH1 now moves to a foreign network? Okay, so, this is the data transfer that is going on. Now, MH1 also moves to some other foreign network. Okay, let us see how that works. You had uh, MH1, HA1, right? This was connected through HA2, okay, and this guy had moved off to FA2 and you had MH2, right. So, now we are saying that MH2, MH1 is moving off to some other network with FA1, okay. So, let us say this guy has moved off to a new network here, okay. So, what is the path that it will take? It will go from MH1 to FA1 to HA1 or HA2. Okay, so let me just leave it as HA1 or HA2 here. Okay, that we need to figure that out. And then once it reaches HA2, things are straightforward, right? HA2 to FA2 to MH2. Correct? <coughs> so now the question is does it go to HA1 or does it go to HA2? Why? Okay, let us say it goes to HA1. Okay? In what case will it go to HA1? If it is a router, then correct. So, if it is a router, see what happens is now this guy has got a new address here, right. So, if the, so if there is a firewall, let us say, you know, where would I draw a firewall now? Okay. So, let us say here we have a firewall after this FA1. Okay. This says that okay, I need to send, I cannot have 
any arbitrary looking address that comes out of here. Okay. So this has a what was the address that we gave to that guy? 10.129.1.1. Okay. So let's say so this has a 10.129.1.1. Okay. This is its original address. And here under the foreign network, let's say it gets some other IP address 10.5.5.5. Okay. Alright. So suppose this foreign network has a firewall here which says that only 10.5 packets can go out. Okay. Now what is this 10.129 packet doing here? And it drops the packet, then you can't go directly to HA2. Okay. So then what you have to do is you have to do a tunnel here. You have to tunnel from FA1 to FA2 uh, to HA1. Okay. And then HA1 will have to decapsulate it and forward it, it forward it onto HA2. Is it making sense what I'm saying? If on the other hand you don't have a firewall here, then you can just let this packet go directly to HA2. See, remember the important thing is the socket is already established. The socket is already established between 10.129 and 10.100.5.2, right? So this is 10.100.5.2, okay? So if either of these machines at the socket level see any other IP address, they are going to break the connection. The connection is going to break, right? So neither MH1 nor MH2 should really see at the IP level. Below IP, you have to be able to do that. Below the uh, socket level, so below TCP or below UDP, before you have the socket, that is where you have to ensure that this is the IP address that the node has got. right? So if you send a packet with 10.129.1.1 going out of a 10.5 network, sometimes the firewall will be configured to say that this is an invalid packet. Okay? So it may drop the packet. So in which case what you have to do is, you have to take a 10.5.5 address as your source and send the packet so that it goes out of the firewall. Does that make sense? Now if I send it directly with a 10.5.5 address to this guy, this chap is going to get confused. Who is this new guy who is talking to me? Right? So that is why I may sometimes have to send the packet home and send it from the home so that the other node does not get confused as to where the packet is coming from. Alright, any other questions on mobile IP? Now there are a lot of intricacies on you know uh, how the advertisement happens how the registration happens, what we do in case of security and all that. So I am just going to happily skip all of it. Okay. Internet provided using mobile IP now? No. Okay. Mobile IP is used in very uh, specific instances. When you have let us say a building combined with wireless it is sometimes used. You know, when you have a building in which wireless is deployed, you know I start a download on my laptop, I carry it from here, I go to some other place. Okay. So at that time the packets have to be forwarded to me. So sometimes you can use it for that. Otherwise, you not you never use it on an internet scale. See, whenever you are going to shut down your machine and restart it, you don't need mobile IP because you can re-establish all your sockets. It's only when there is any ongoing socket communication that you need something like mobile IP. Okay, as far as hardware configuration is concerned, of a normal router versus a mobile IP router. Okay, what is the difference? the router has to be able to send out advertisements. Okay. So a normal router also sends out router advertisements. Same router advertisement message, if you can add something to it, that becomes a mobile IP advertisement. Okay. So very little change is required to the router. Okay. Instead of tunneling, can I not change the source address? So let us see. What we are trying to do is, we are trying to send this as a tunnel. I could change the source address, but then again, if the home agent is not the same as the router, then the router will block it, uh, the firewall will block it, correct? And secondly, in order to change the, it kind of breaks the encapsulation philosophy, right? I mean, I am going into a packet, changing it, so it is it's preferred to just put it into another packet. So technically, yes, it is possible, but it is not done. Right. Okay. So we'll take a break. Before the break, let me just tell you what is left. Okay. So what we have left to do is TCP. How many of you are familiar with TCP? Okay. Few of you. Okay. So we have to do a little bit of 
how TCP works, how TCP works over wireless, okay. We will do a little bit of how ad hoc networks work and then why max, okay. So that is kind of what I have planned for the rest of the time, okay. It is a bit early to take the break but then I will still let you off, okay. <laughs>